multiple award-winning authors, the Double Trouble team of T. Morris and Pip Ballantyne. Sit down for a one-on-one discussion. Up next. Okay, so welcome to the Ozzy Osbourne Show. I'm your host, William J. Bruce the Third, and uh, we're now in episode five. We have on the phone T. Morris and Pip Ballantyne. Uh, T. and Pip, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. It's a pleasure. Cool. Um, so, okay, I'll just I'll start off by asking, what got both of you interested in writing to begin with? Um, lots and lots of reading for me. Um, my dad had always been a, a big science fiction reader, so, uh, and I, I'm a pretty fast reader as well, like he is, so, um, I ended up getting to the end of all the books he had, and then I was like, well, obviously I have to write my own one. And for myself, I, I started off reading as well, and, uh, one of the things that I, I tend to do when I was, uh, when I was sick from school, um, I, I was never a good patient. I didn't like staying in bed and doing nothing. So right. I would grab my, my parents' typewriter. Uh, for the younger people in your audience, a typewriter is like <laughs> a computer, but it uses paper instead of a, a view screen. And I would go on ahead and I would, uh, I would hammer out uh, stories that way. So that was how I, uh, eventually got into writing. Uh, modern day, my, my most recent Stuff, though uh, I admit I didn't set out to be a writer. I yep. was doing an online role play with someone, and about halfway through it, we were doing it through email. And I said to, to the, uh, the other girl, "I said I think this would make a pretty banging novel." And we went back and we, we started to retool it, and we stopped playing it as a role play, and wound up doing it as our very first novel. Wow! Now that that's Moravi, right? That is, yeah. That wow, is. yeah. <laughs> it's always <laughs> nice to hear people uh, remember me for that first book many, many moons ago. But yeah, that was that was the very first book uh, that I wrote alongside Lisa Lee, yeah. and uh, that's what got this roller coaster ride started for me. Very cool. Now you both sort of started in in different genres, and you've both seemed to have, have more or less sort of merged into steampunk. Is that correct? Um, we we like little butterflies. We kind of go. Um, wherever our imagination takes us. So we both still write fantasy and science fiction, but um, we write together as pretty much all steampunk. Okay. And uh, because of the demands of steampunk, uh, I haven't had a chance to really... I've got some ideas off the ground, but I haven't completed any of them, mainly because we've been going back to, to, to the world of the Ministry of Peculiar Currency. Um, as, uh, as, as you may know, uh, at the beginning of the summer, we just release in print the fifth book in the in the series which is called the ghost rebellion and just yesterday uh, yesterday at this recording uh, uh pip and i are, are putting on the final touches on the curse of the silver pharaoh which is uh a, a ya spin-off novel from the ministry series yes. so it's been a it's been a busy year and uh you know i, I i'm still planning to, to to get my foot back into into fantasy and into science fiction but uh, I, I, I love writing steampunk, especially with, with that. It's, it's just a lot of fun. That's cool. What, what is it that, that draws you guys to steampunk? Cause I find it, it's very interesting. Oh, so many things. So many things. <laughs> all the pretties, all um, the pretties. Well, I mean, a lot of people get focused on the aesthetic, the look, the brass, the bronze, the, the cobs and the gears. But, um, for, for me, I really like the uh, ability to mess around with history. And to examine and maybe pull into the light some interesting characters from the Victorian era that people don't know about. The, the, the unofficial tagline for steampunk is the past that never was. And that, that's the big deal for me as well. Taking all these things that Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and Mary Shelley imagined and bringing them to life. And, and it, it, it's just a, it, it's a, it's a, a very fertile playground for the imagination. Um, now, how many books have have you guys written uh, collectively? <laughs> um, well, we're uh, five novels. Oh, more than that. Oh, sorry, six novels. <laughs> six novels together. Okay. And then there are the short stories, and there's been uh, we've collaborated on one, two, at least three short stories. Yeah. And um, then 
where our names appear together in a novella collection. So there's that. Uh, I'm starting to lose count. We, we've know. got quite a bit. It's in the team. <laughs> it's in the team. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. I, I was looking, looking you guys up and I, I tried to have like, you know, some information about the numbers and stuff. And so the fact that you guys are losing count makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> 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 um, now, um, for, for T, I understand that, that you sort of conceived the idea for the original Potia book. Um, how did you come up with that? Wow. Uh, man, you're, you're reaching back. The good news is that it's good to reach back on this topic because I just, did an article for Tor.com about this subject. Uh, it was it was back in uh, 2004 when I came up with the idea, uh, and I got to preface this with what I did for for Moravia in 2002. We were we were trying to come up. I, I just read a book uh, on on well, you know how to how to launch your book. It was basically I think it was something like the complete idiot's guide to getting published. Okay. And uh, I, I remember a couple things about that book. The first thing I remember is that one of the co-authors was a up-and-coming author that no one really knew named Cory Doctorow, which I thought was kind of cool, uh, looking back on it now. The other thing I remember is they were talking about throwing book launches. And so for the Moravi book launch, I tapped some friends of mine who are uh, professional stage combat choreographers and performers, and I said, how about coming to my, uh, my first book signing and, and you know, crashing in this pirate, and then we have a great big sword battle, and we did. And wow. it, was, uh, it, was, it was really, it was, it was a really big hit. We sold a lot of books that night, and my publisher at Dragon Moon Press said, "Okay, your new book's coming out. You got to top that." And that was when podcasting was just starting to get off the ground. And I remember calling up a couple friends of mine, uh, Michael R. and Evo Terra, and yep. they were podcasting their radio show. And I, I asked them, I said. How would you guys feel if I if I uh, if I podcast Moravi one chapter at a time once a week on your show? And they said, "Wow, that's, that's nuts!" But we love it. So I started producing uh, producing content for them, and they ran it as part of their feed. And from there, I, I think I got maybe four episodes out, and then okay. another author stepped up and said. I'd like to do this with my book, and it's a YA novel, and uh, that was Mark Jeffrey. He did The Pocket of the Pendant. Yeah. And then a couple weeks after Mark started, uh, this, this other guy named Scott Sigler stepped up, and he said, I've got a book that's never been published, and this will be uh, you know, exclusive only in the podcast. So uh-huh. it was three of us, Scott Sigler, Mark Jeffrey, and me, and within, within a span of uh, two to three months, we started podcasting novels. And from there, that led to audiobooks.com, and to everything that's been happening uh, today. And like I said, this Tor.com article has got a chance to look back on uh, on the history of, of, of podcasting. And, and it's, it's astounding uh, how much fiction has been podcast uh, just just in the past, just, just in the first 10 years of podcasting, the first five years of podcasting alone. And uh, we're coming up on, we're coming up on 10 years of people podcasting novels and it's a, it, it, and short stories. It's a, it's a great thing to see. And, also kind of humbling when I think, okay, I kicked this off. All right, I'll I'll, I'll roll with that. If you want to give me credit? I'll I'll take credit. I'll be glad to take credit. But really, For sure. the publicity stunt. A very very cool publicity stunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. How much time do you have to put into converting a regular book into an an audio book? Ooh, or, or, or an audio book. Well, it depends on how you do the uh, production. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to turn it to Pip for, for, uh, for an audio book, and I'll, I'll, I'll take it up for a podcast. I don't know. Okay. I think the, uh, the Ghost Rebellion recorded, fully recorded, is 10 hours. Okay. But, that, but then you probably multiply by that by about three, I think, for actual recording and production. Okay. Um, so, I, yeah, I would say about 30 hours solid work. Okay. And that's just a plain read. That's not including sound, you know, sound effects and stuff. Right. Uh, oh, okay. I know that with, uh, with, with the short stories that we get with, uh, with Tales from the Archives, they're read by other people, by the actual author. And what we do is we take, we take their audio, we, we, we pepper it with music and with sound effects, and that takes us maybe two or three days to produce. 
Okay. And if we're the ones writing the story, we have to write the story. So write in the editing our own story. That's a week. And then there's a week of us recording, editing, and then putting in all the special effects. So you're looking at two weeks worth of work just for a short story. Wow. If I wanted to take, uh, if I wanted to take the Ghost Rebellion and make it a patio book, okay. uh, the, the, the trick would be is that, you know, how would I want to do it? Do I want to do it, uh, just, you know, with my own voice and, and that's it? Or do I want to do it like I did with Billy Batting, where I had guest voices and I had sound effects and I had music? If that happens, instead of, uh, tripling that time, instead of taking that 10 hours of audio and tripling it, I would say take that 10 hours of audio and then add, uh, add, add, multiply it by six. Because okay. then I'm starting to deal with other, other audio sources. I've got to deal with timing. I've got to deal with setting a mood. And that really changes it up. For sure. So it all depends on what kind of podcast you want to do. But with Audible, uh, it, it's, just a, it's just a straight up read. And that makes life a lot easier for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. Um, how, how did you and Evo Terra, uh, connect originally? So, Evo and Mike were doing a show called The Dragon Page. Okay. And The Dragon Page was, uh, uh, a, a radio show. At first it went from internet radio to, uh, terrestrial radio, and then it got into podcast. Okay. And the, the show was, was dedicated to authors and authors of fiction and science fiction, fantasy and horror. And I was one of their guests. And I came on their show, and we really hit it off. And then I, they called me up and said, uh, you know, we'd like to come back on the show again. So I came back on the show again. And then uh, the guys were just calling me at random. Uh, I was sort of the guest that if they needed to pad for time, they just called me up just okay. to see what I was doing. And sometimes I'd be working on a project. Sometimes I'd be doing something around the house. But it, it, was, it, was, we all, it was always quality audio we created. And yeah. uh, we became fast friends with three of them. And... And that was how I hooked up with, uh, with, with, with the guys. And then when, uh, when podcasting started taking off and, uh, I was asked to write podcasts for dummies, they said, uh, you know, uh, is there anybody you want to bring on board? I said, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm good with the content creation, but when it comes to the technical side of it, I think we really need to go to my friends in Rotera. So, uh, Eva and I wrote the very first edition of Podcasting for Dummies. And when we went into the second edition, we brought in uh, Chuck Tomasi from Technorama, and I, I feel very fortunate to have pre- to have built the friendships, uh, including the person sitting next to me right here uh, in podcasting. It's been a, it's been a great journey. For sure. Speaking of the person right next to you, um, so Pip, you're originally from New Zealand. Um, did you find it harder to to get an agent and get published? Um, no, surprisingly not. I mean, um, I when I like way back in the dim dark ages when I was a teenager in New Zealand trying to get published. It was difficult. This was before the internet, so you had to like print off your entire manuscript and sort of send it off into the great unknown. And generally speaking, you never heard about it again. Um, so the uh, arrival of the internet and email has made a lot of things much, much easier for uh, people who live overseas. I was able to uh, hunt down an agent from uh, New Zealand and secure one. Um, I even had a slight advantage because back in those days they didn't um, accept anything but paper manuscripts from people who were in America. Okay. Uh, but if you were international, they gave you a pass and let you submit via email. Uh, so yeah, it, uh, it was really good for me to to be part of the podcasting movement as well because I felt like I had a a community already inbuilt. For sure. Now, you guys ended up collaborating uh i'm assuming that was sort of how you got into the relationship um <laughs> <laughs> I- you would think so but uh, actually she and i uh, uh, both of our first books were published by dragon moon press in okay Canada. and so we actually knew each other before podcasting sort of i mean online knew each other okay uh i actually wrote the person c morris who had been um they just sold his book, and I was like, so you're coming about Dragon Moon. And then he was like, well, now you need to be doing podcasting. So I actually see Drag me into, into podcasting. That's the collaboration cool. certainly came about because we were both in that same community. And um, it was basically because I was doing an experiment. I want, it was 2009? It was, a, it was between 2008 and 2009. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, 
people were talking back then about the idea of uh, monetizing podcasting directly. Um, this was before Patreon or Kickstarter or anything. And I was like, well, you know, I wouldn't mind trying uh, to do a serial uh, that it would be podcast for pay and just see how it goes. And then I thought, well, I don't really want to do all the work. I don't want to really write all that by myself. Maybe if I split the work with, with some person that's uh, crazy enough to join me. Um, and uh, that's how she and I got into writing the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences. It was basically started off as a, a podcast for pay, and then uh, the agent was like, oh, suddenly we have some interest in it, and it became a book. So it never actually became, the novel itself never became a podcast. But then okay. we did go on and make a, uh, a podcast series of short stories to support the uh, release of the book. But actually our first collaboration wasn't a book. It was it was a, um, uh, a promotional campaign huh. for... Uh, for so, so I was getting ready to release a sequel to another series I'd started with Dragon Link Press. Okay. Um, and and I was, that was a, it was a sequel in the Bill about Batting's mystery. Uh, this, was, this was the case of the pictures pendant. And I mentioned that it was going to be launched on 888 on August 8, 2008. That's and I cool. got a really snarky um, tw- Twitter exchange from, from Pip at the time saying, are you really going to release this on my birthday? And, <laughs> and, I, and, then I, and I was like, oh, crap. I didn't realize it was going to be your birthday. And then she said that was when I was planning to release my book. Because uh, she had a sequel coming out for... I remember being very annoyed with you. Were, you were really annoyed with <laughs> yeah. um, And um, she was about to release a sequel sequel to Chasing the Bard. And I said, well, how about we do this? Why don't we collaborate on uh, an Amazon rush? And we will do, we'll call it Double Trouble. We'll, we'll make the date 888. And we will release our book at the same time. And because she was in New Zealand at the time and I was in the States, I said, it'll start on midnight my time <laughs> and it will go to midnight your time. Oh, that's so cool. This whole Almost a almost a twenty four hour push, and we were we were doing uh we were doing a, a live and this this is again before the days of Facebook Live and stuff like that. We were going on Uvu. I remember. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, Uvu. We were going on Uvu and doing uh doing live uh video chats with people, and we were we were uh giving away books, and we were we, we did uh we had designed um, screen savers and, and and avatars for yeah. Twitter. And this this is back in the dark ages of social media. Um, you know, this this is when yeah, this is when you could go on Twitter and you knew people, you knew everybody in your network, and um, and we watched. And I want to say we got it. We got both titles in the top fifty overall in Amazon, and we did we did really well for for a couple of a uh, couple of whippersnappers from uh, from 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 uh, Virginia and New Zealand. So yeah, that was our first collaboration, and then like I and then like you said. You know, uh, we started we started collaborating on this book, and then somehow it became a, a permanent thing. <laughs> I got no complaints. I got no complaints. <laughs> okay, um, so I have a, a question for Pip, because um, you had collaborated, you know, before with an author, and the, the book never, you know, got got finished. You said like, oh, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what what gave you the confidence to 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 work with with T? Um, I guess with the the previous collaboration, I hadn't really known the person that well. Yeah. Um, I guess I'd known T at least online for like three years, I suppose. Um, so I had a bit more confidence that he would actually get get things done. Um, I think, uh, at least when we started off, we had an a good solid idea of what we wanted to do. Um, I found with the, the previous collaboration that. I had different expectations of what the collaboration was going to be, and there was just not enough communication there to actually straighten it out. So I, I, I think that gave me a lot of groundwork for dealing with the next person, and I knew that I would be able to work with T better than I had with the previous. And uh, for my own, for my own uh, part, I remember when Pip approached me about collaborating on this idea. I was kind of gun shy about it because. When I first collaborated with Lisa Leah Moravi, it was it was good. What we did was 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 really solid. But then for the second novel, it was a bit like pulling teeth, and I knew there was a 
problem when I read, sat down and wrote like 5,000 words, and when Lisa brought in her collaboration, it was 500 words. Oh, and I was yeah. like, huh, this thing's going to work work all too well. And then suddenly she cut off all communication with me. And that was why the second book in the series was my was a solo work. Okay. I basically cut her stuff out, and I wrote that book from beginning to end on my own. And uh, it was it was a, a it was bittersweet because I said, okay, well, I've proven to myself that I can write in this universe, but I didn't know where I wanted to go with it. And uh, when 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 I started doing other works, I lost some interest in going back to Moravian. For sure. Whereas with uh, with the whole Ministry of the Occurrences from the beginning, uh, Pip and I were just firing on all pistons, and I was like, I'm really digging this 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 collaboration. And then just as recently as with Silver Pharaoh, uh, Tiff wanted to head one direction. I said, well, what if we went in this direction? She said, oh, I like that. And then it became, it became very much a, a, a back and forth, a dance. And, uh, and it was, it was really a lot of, it's been a lot of fun working with Tiff. And, um, you've got to say anything, right? I, well, yeah, you're going to punch <laughs> me if I don't. Um, <laughs> but, the, but the other thing too is that it's a very different type of collaboration. Um, there's been, there's been, Work that Pip has done, uh, not necessarily in the ministry universe, but in, in other, in other, uh, properties, like Harbinger, uh, the, the Books of the Order, for example, that's all Pip. Uh, she's, she's bounced ideas off of me, but that's been all Pip. And, um, when we, when we collaborate, it's understood that it's a very different thing. It's gotta be a give and take. And I think that's, that's something that was very different from when I was working with Lisa. For sure. Okay, um, so my my wife is gonna kill me if I, I don't ask. Um, how how did your your uh, working relationship evolve into a uh, marital relationship? Wow, <laughs> it's made everything much much easier. Uh, uh, well, you know, you you work out things, and and I was so far away. Um, we were separated. We, we were. We weren't even in the same time zone uh, during Phoenix Rising, and then uh, the Janus affair. It was like started things started to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it was. Uh, there was there was a real. Um, you know, I I, I called I, I called this, this this journey with um with uh with publishing a roller coaster ride, and I would I would say that around the time of the Janus affair uh, is where I hit the the, the lower dip uh, because okay. um. It, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was a, it was a really rough time for me. And I was very fortunate that Pip was there for me. And I found out, you know, I, I think this is more than just a, a casual <laughs> well, co- or professional collaboration. By that stage, we've been friends for like years. Well, like online. almost a second. Almost a yeah. second. So it, it just, I don't know, it organically morphed into. That's a good word for it. Organically it's morphed. Organically morphed. It's organic. Like Blue Apron. <laughs> it's much better to be able to. Just uh, say, hey, you know, look across the sofa and say, hey, what do you think of this? <laughs> Rather than having to try and get someone on Skype and that. It just made, made everything so much easier. <laughs> this was For not sure. a marriage of convenience, though. <laughs> That's what you're making it sound like. <laughs> For sure. Um, okay. Um, so how do you both complement each other? Like, since you, you guys are like, you know, like a, a, a writing team, basically. Well, there's, there are certain things that he does better than I do, and yeah. hopefully there's some, I don't know, I would say that he is really good on the humor and the, uh, the fighting. He's much better at the action scenes, uh, than I am. So to the point where I actually sometimes just write, he write a, some, this, this person has to get from point A to point B, you know, figure it out, uh, there needs to be a fight thing, go. Yeah. I would say uh, Pip, Pip's, a, Pip's much stronger at setting a scene, at narration. Uh, okay. You know, s- setting a setting a, a, a mood. You setting can say down. creepy. I'm also good at you, creepy. You're good at the creep. You bring the creep. Um, <laughs> but I, w- I would say that that that's. Uh, I mean, that was what we, we experienced with the with, with the Silver Pharaoh. I came in uh, with with this one chapter, and and I just noticed there were some great set pieces. Uh, Pippin put up some great, great, uh, great setups, but I'm like, we need some dialogue here. We need, we need a little bit of action here. We need, and so I started bringing in. Or, or I like to say, just juice it up. Juice it up, yeah. And so, um, so that's, that, that's Pippin's strength that I would be like, oh, that's a beautiful setting. Um, 
that's a beautiful setup with this line, and I bring that in. And uh, so I, w- I would say that's how we complement each other is that uh, if Pip sets them up, I knock them down. That's cool. That's very cool. Um, okay, so now you've you've both have been with um, both small presses and big presses. Um, can you tell us your experiences? What what are maybe like uh, you know pluses and minuses oh, of each? Oh, there are so many. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, there are good things about both. Well, about all three. About about, about small press. Small press. press I mean, um, big press is very nice in the fact that they um, have the distribution. And they have the machine behind them. Um, but, and, and I was very, very lucky to get some great covers. I and mean, yeah. we got some great covers yeah, off, uh, uh, Big Press. That, that being said, on the other, other side, um, you have to write to their schedule. You have to, um, uh, they give you the cover. Generally speaking, they give you the cover. I think cover, their cover requirements these days, they are sometimes, uh, asking authors to, Provide some input, input, some kind of input. Um, small press obviously was our training ground, and we learned a lot about you know the editorial process and how what goes you know goes. We, we learned a lot about marketing. Yeah, marketing was the, the idea of uh, with, with the big presses. They're like, well, you, you know, your marketing, we we quote unquote, we will take care of, and they they just tell us they tell you to step away. Whereas with small small presses, they're like, well, your marketing is on your own. So you've got to you've got to do some research, and uh, I would say that that the, the path we went, we went from small press to large press. Um, we took all the stuff we learned from small press, and we applied it to our large press, uh, our, our our large press, and uh, we we just made sure that whatever we did marketing wise didn't interfere or overlap with what uh, with what the the larger the larger New York houses were doing. When it came to indie press, though. Um, you know, self-publishing is, uh, as it was once called. Well, yeah, we consider ourselves hybrid. Yeah, we, yeah, we call ourselves, um, you know, hybrid because we've done, we, we do both. I mean, just because we are publishing, uh, the Ghost of Bellion and the Curse of the Silver Pharaoh on our own, on our own dime, that does not mean that we would not turn down money from another publisher. I think, I think it's For sure. flexible to be flexible on yeah. that sort of thing. But what's, what's, a, what's astounding about, uh, is that indie, that the indie publishing uh, route has been uh, how far it's come just in five years. Mm-hmm. Um, it's become a lot easier to self-publish your own book. Okay. It's become a lot easier to um, to create really stunning covers. Uh, the covers we have for the Ghost Rebellion and First the Silver Pharaoh, people look at them and they go, these are absolutely beautiful covers. And we go, yeah, and we, we, we can afford them. Uh, what's been what, what's been amazing is, is that um, uh, it, it's just uh, learning how these how these things are put together, and that I think is something that you lose with in independent publishing that you you actually gain with, uh, with 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 big and even to some extent uh, small small print houses is because you are independently publishing this. It is up to you to get the cover done. So all the time that, that you would have that, that someone else would be investing in, now you're investing that time. But I would recommend to any author. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't care if it was a, an up and coming author or if it was Neil Gaiman. I would say do a self publishing project from, from beginning to end and really get to know the process of working with of working with all the editors and lining them up and working with uh, the, the, the graphic designers to get the layout right and working with graphic artists. Get the cover right. It's a fascinating process, and, and I, I consider ourselves lucky for the experiences. For sure. Um, now, you you guys have like a a, a role playing. Sorry, it's just a little uh, little off beat from where we were. Um, you have a role playing game, the the Ministry right. Initiative. Um, how did that come about? <laughs> oh, now I'm, I got to turn this over. <laughs> the lesson here is never say something offhand at a science fiction convention because it could come back to haunt you. <laughs> uh, now, as with all ministry things, it seems to happen all organically and off the cuff. That's a nice way of saying and accidentally. Accidentally. Uh, uh, we've seen a lot of faith and accidents involved. Uh, we were at Baltimore, Baltimore, uh, Maryland, and we met uh, Brennan's 
Taylor of Galileo Games, who uh, we know through a friend, J.R. Blackwell. And uh, he apparently thought that I was pitching to him. And I apparently thought I was making a joke. Uh, my joke, I thought, was, well, hey, wouldn't the Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences make a great role-playing game? Hi! And his uh, interpretation was, hey, Brennan, I really would like you to make a role-playing game. And, uh, we, so fast forward like now. Six months? Six months. Yeah. And we get a, we get a, well, not we. I got an email from J.R. Blackwell, uh, that said, hey, Steve, Brennan and I just finished talking and we wanted to know how serious was Pip about pitching, uh, the Minister of Peculiar Occurrences as a role playing game and, uh, what kind of turnaround did you want to, did you want to see on this? Uh-huh. And I'm staring at this email and I look up from my computer and I go, Pip, did you Pitch <laughs> a ministry role playing game to Brennan Taylor of Galileo Games, and Pip looked at me like I was speaking Greek, and she was like, "Well, I go, oh my God, I thought I was serious." <laughs> <laughs> and from there, from there, we came another came another education for us, which was um, we, we basically got together with with, with um, some really incredibly talented people. Uh, there was Jared Blackwell, there was Brennan Taylor. T.J. Schneider, who is our, who wound up being the game writer, um, Alex White, Alex did White, who did all the cover work. We all sat down and we started we started talking about all the uh, all the, the, the nuts and bolts, and we said, okay, well, we're in between publishers at that time as well, so we were planning on doing an anthology, and uh, we all sat down and said, okay, well, why don't we do this? Let's do a joint anthology called the Ministry Initiative, and half of the money would go to the role playing game. The other half the money would go to the uh, would go to the anthology, okay. and we said, okay, how much are we going to need to pull this off? And we said, we're going to need twenty thousand dollars. And this was the biggest, this was the biggest Kickstarter that Galileo Games had ever done. And in the end, we wound up making thirty thousand dollars. Very this cool. This experience is great for us because we we went into uh, we went into this knowing nothing about Kickstarter, mm-hmm. and okay. we helped promote, we helped design. We, Put together the video, and we learned about the mechanics and about the, the do's and don'ts of hosting Kickstarter. So fast forward a few more years, and we decide uh, the publisher does the, the, the publisher does not want to go any further with the ministry novels, but we do. So we said well, we got two more novels in us. So let's go on ahead, and let's do a Kickstarter for the first novel, and let's see if we can make enough to write the second. Very cool. So we were asking initially for six thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah, it was six thousand dollars. For a uh, for, 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 for one book for, for the Ghost Rebellion, and we hit the we hit our goal within the first uh, the first week of this four week Kickstarter. By the end, we had asked for six, and we got over twenty one thousand dollars. Wow! And, all, and all these lessons learned from the first Kickstarter, we had applied to the second Kickstarter. So yeah, that was how it all that was that was sort of the road with the uh, the, the the role playing game. Which yes, we have played, and it's it's hella fun. <laughs> wow, that is really cool. I didn't know about that. Yeah. So okay, that being said, is there any uh, chance of any new board games? <laughs> oh well, we'd have to be approached by the right people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, pitching that one to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> that would be very cool. Um, I know that uh, I've seen a lot of. Uh, games being kickstarted, and I know the costs are much, much higher for yeah. for a uh, tabletop game. Okay. Um, that being said, we're open. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we would. I mean, I, I, we would gladly. I, I, I don't know if I would want a board game as much as if I would want a, a card game, a collectible card game. That would be cool. Um, there seems to be a trend with steampunk and card games because okay. I know that uh, Magic: The Gathering just launched a, uh, a steampunk inspired uh, uh, expansion pack. So why not? That's very cool. So switching again, um, what were your your guys' influences growing up? What what was it that got you in? Oh, uh, well, um, I read like, and like I said, I read a lot of my dad's um, books. So my my sort of favorite authors were like a uh, Andre Norton and McCaffrey, and but my absolute favorite C J uh, Cherry, who hopefully we're gonna get some. I'm gonna get to meet. Uh, I've met a lot of cool people at conventions, but I've never met um, her. So uh, Philcon coming up in this, this 
December. I, I think no, it's November. The, sorry, November. Pocom, I can't remember. But I'm very excited. Yeah, we're going to look up the dates. Don't worry. Um, so for, and for me, uh, it, was, it was actually two people uh, that, that really had an influence on me, um, which were uh, Terry Brooks, uh, the guy who wrote the uh, Shannara Chronicles, and uh, my contemporary English teacher. Her name was uh, Alex McGrath. And when we were uh, when we were uh, launching RavenCon, which was a, a science fiction fantasy convention based in Richmond, it's not Williamsburg, but it was originally based in Richmond. We did a high school outreach in my at my alma mater, and uh, Miss McGrath was still teaching there. And I had my photograph taken with Terry Brooks, who was our guest of honor. Uh, he was on one side of me, and uh, Miss McGrath was on the other side of me, and I'm in the middle. And it wasn't until after the photograph was taken, I stared at that photograph and I said. Not many writers can say they can bookend by their inspiration. <laughs> so um, I'm very lucky in that respect as well. Oh, really? Wow, that's cool. Okay, so for the um, – you guys have actually gotten two Parsec Awards. Is that right? Together we've gotten – together we've gotten two. Okay. We've got – I think it's the, you won one. Yes. I won one. Then we won one together. So that's three. Okay. <laughs> and then we won uh, – so that's, that's three Parsec Awards there. And then you've got Paul Herring who, uh, right. for the who wrote for the ministry. He won one as well. So that's, that's, four, that's four Parsec Awards the ministry takes. Yeah. Very cool. What, what what's that like for your, for you guys to to get that recognition? Uh, it was it was always nice to when you have your um, your peers recognize you and and they make nice things on on the uh, you know conversation starters. Yeah, on your, yeah. Uh, and it was I, I particularly enjoyed the the time where I won one because his story was in the same category and so I beat him. <laughs> That's cool. Same podcast, but different yeah. story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, was, that was a good time. Yeah, good time. that was a good time. Um, I, I would say of all the awards that we won, um, I mean, all of them were 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 very humbled by the fact that we that we gotten that sort of recognition. Because some authors never get that recognition. Now they get the sales, but they don't ever get the recognition. Yeah. Um, personally, I would say no to the sales, but uh, sales, and sales and recognition. But I think the one that surprised me the most was when. We were uh, we were up for Best Steampunk for RT's, uh, which is Romantic Times, the RT Book Review's uh, Choice Reviewer Award, Choice. Reviewer's Choice, uh, for Best Steampunk in 2014. And Dawn's Early Life was in there, alongside some real heavy hitters. And we were the third book in the series, so I was like, well, hey, we made the short list, so I got no complaints. And then we got the, uh, the, the phone call that basically said, you guys won. And I remember uh, Pip had to completely drop drop what we were doing that weekend. She had to fly out and, and accept the award on 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 her own while I was, while I ran a five k with our with our daughter. So <laughs> um, that 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 award was the one that surprised me the most, and I was very pleased uh, with, with 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 that win. Um, but any any kind of peer recognition, uh, you know, it's it, it's humbling. It's very very humbling. For sure. Now you guys have had like two projects, uh, uh, like this year. You have the, the Ghost Rebellion, which came out in June. Um, can you tell us about it? Uh, well, that was that was the result of the Kickstarter last year. So the okay. book of the Ghost Rebellion. Um, it takes place in India and Russia. It is um, got a beautiful cover that we that we funded through the Kickstarter, and um, we, it, we we did our own audio book. And it's uh, ebook and print, so we're we're pretty proud of it. Yeah, it takes place uh, shortly after the events of the fourth book, and okay. uh, and and, it, and we're we're basically building up to, to book six. But the the book five, there are uh, there are a few reveals. Uh, it's kind of hard kind of hard to describe the, the, the plot of, uh, of of the Ghost Rebellion because if we go into details, it no, it, 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 it it releases a whole bunch of spoilers. But safe to say. It's uh, it's it's Wellington and Eliza, and they're on they're on the uh, they're on they're on the chase with uh, after uh, Dr. Henry Jekyll, and and it's and it's, a it's a chase it's a chase it's a chase, uh, and and when and when we get to book six, book six will be the last book in the series. Very cool. What made you set it in India in Russia? <laughs> 
Well, I mean, we've done a lot of the ministry books are set in England uh, and one set in America. And we wanted to explore the wider world. We wanted to get into the um, imperial politics, I guess, of Great Britain at the time. And I, a lot of steampunk concentrates on America and England. And I think that the, obviously the world is wider than that. So we were, we were ready to bust out. Plus we'd done a lot of short stories that were set in different parts of the world. And so it seemed only fair for Elijah Wellington to actually get some time outside of London. That's, that's cool. So now you, you also have a new book that, um, it's come out, The Curse of the Silver Pharaoh. Uh, can you tell us about that? Well, this is uh, a spin-off, I guess you would say, but also a prequel uh, to the, the main Ministry of Peculiar Occurrences. Okay. Uh, in the Ministry, there are uh, some helpers, some Baker Street Irregulars, if mm. you will, for Eliza and Wellington for the Ministry 7, who are a bunch of um, street urchins who have had to survive you know, uh, the perils of London. So they're smart kids, they're resourceful, they're got potty mouths now and then because they, you know, that's who they are. Um, so we wanted to investigate how they came, you know, what did other adventures they had when they're not around Wellington or Eliza. So the Silver Fair is set before Phoenix Rising, the first book of the Ministry, and it uh, introduces some new characters that we've had a lot of fun with, but also there are some familiar faces that crop up now and then because there's some crossover, obviously, from the earlier books. Um, and it involves um, creepy manor houses in Cornwall and a uh, rather scary pharaoh and uh, Egyptology. Okay. Um, what else are you guys up to um, these days? Uh, well, um, we're still... The, the, the thing is, with, with, the, with the Silver Pharaoh and with the Ghost Rebellion, uh, we can now return to some things that we've been doing uh, specifically for... Uh, Kickstarter. Uh, we, we have to finish up the audio books of our, of our, our steampunk fairy tale novella. Uh, we released something called Mechanical, uh, no, sorry, Magical, Magical Mechanication. Uh, it's Magical Mechanication, and it's currently available as an ebook. It's four novellas, uh, two written by Tiff and two written by me of fairy tales that we went on ahead and we, we steampunk. And, uh, currently we're working on the audiobook for that. Uh, so there, so there, there's that project we have to get off our plate next. There's book six, Operation Endgame. We have started it and we are, we're, 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 we're working through it. The aim for that is to have it, to have the, to have the, um, the, the first draft done and, uh, and ready for a severe overhaul, uh, after we're done with it. Um, and then in between all of this, we have, uh, which was the ridiculous, we, 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 we made this a ridiculous, uh, uh, stretch goal because we didn't think we would make $20,000. And yeah. the ridiculous stretch goal was to write a novella that's referenced in book four. In book four of, uh, of, of the series called The Diamond Conspiracy, Wellington and Eliza received standing orders from the ministry through a, uh, a, a terribly written erotic novel called Countless Views of Crimson. And when we were doing the Kickstarter for books five and six, we said at twenty thousand dollars we will actually write this ridiculous, terrible, erotic and now we have novel. To do it. And we have to do it now. And um <laughs> the 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 It count, has a cover. It has a cover. And Countless Views of Crimson not only will be a, a, a terrible erotic novel, it will actually have secret messages for ministry agents. There'll be one featured in each chapter and uh and, and the trick is trying to find it. Now the background uh -huh. will actually get the coded version, but uh, but this is going to be probably one of the silliest things we will have ever written, <laughs> and uh, and it should be a lot of fun. So we we have a very full plate, and and uh, and it's, it's going to last we're us. Just living with the deadline. Yeah, we're yeah. we're going to we're going to probably follow this all the way into uh, 2017. Okay. Also, the one thing we're going to be doing in November uh, is we're going to be launching the fifth and final season. A Tales from the Archives, which is the, uh, the anthology that we won the Parsec for. Okay. And, uh, this will be our, like I said, our fifth season. And we're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up with this one because, uh, this was, this, this was worthwhile. This was, this, this was a fun, fun journey. Five seasons. I think we're gonna end on a high note. Okay. That sounds cool. 
Okay, well, that looks like the end of the episode. But thank you guys for being on the show. It's really cool to like to just chat with you guys and sort of pick your brains, you know. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey guys, thank you for tuning into the Ozzy Osbourne Radio Show. For more episodes, you can check out OzzyOsbourne.com. That's A U S S I E Osbourne.com. God bless.